Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art. Um, I'm going to be reading more of this article that I found while I was researching a scientific paper. It's called The Safety of Nuclear Power, written by Alvin M. Weinberg, one of the first nuclear liars that continued to lie. Uh, look when it was released, 102506, look when it was written. This was a re this was basically a a, a a presentation in front of a group of scientists that really is run by the military and it's out in Colorado and these are people they they regularly meet um, the advancement of science writing it's one of those people this was done 1973. Anyways, I think I'm on page four. I've been reading this. I read it the other night, and we're at the place where it says reactor. And what he is doing here, just to remind you, is he's going to be talking about the four subsets. And I finished reading mining and refining in the last reading. So now we're going to read about reactor. There are two quite different potential hazards from a nuclear reactor. First, there are the routine effluents, including tritium, which is a radioactive form of hydrogen, radioactive fission gases from possible leaking fuel elements, radioactive cobalt from corrosive products, etc. Second, there is the question of a major catastrophic accident to a nuclear reactor that might result in an appreciable fraction of the radioactive inventory being released into the environment. Holy fuck, we don't have a fraction. We have fucking all of it. As for the first, the release of small quantities of radiation. This matter was the subject of some controversy a few years ago as a result of questioning by John Goffman and Arthur Tamplin. You notice he doesn't say Dr. John Goffman and Dr. Arthur Tamplin. At the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, as to the adequacy of the radiation standards then in force. I shall not go into the merits of their argument, because he can't, he, can't, he cannot argue them, but shall simply state that the current standards are now so low, 5% of the amount we receive from natural resources at the reactor's site boundary as to make the whole issue a non-issue. So as if we get 5% of the natural resource amount, that makes man-made plutonium safe if it's only at the perimeter. This is the kind of fucking, this is why this article is important, you guys. This is the kind of corrupt thinking this motherfucker pushed on everybody and has convinced every single nuclear scientist is valid science. By comparison... The added radiation one gets from sleeping adjacent to one's wife. Fuck. By comparison, the added radiation one gets by sleeping adjacent to one's wife, whose body, as does everyone's, contains radioactive potassium, is around 7% of the standard for a reactor site boundary. This is the false equivalency. 7% sleeping next to your wife. 7% potassium radiation. The radiation from your wife is not going to kill you, you stupid motherfucker. This is the classic case of balancing benefits versus risks. And indeed, nuclear power plants are now designed to meet these very stringent requirements. And in fact, are doing so. Here, a technological fix has completely resolved a controversy. Oops, we fixed it. No worries. Fuck, man. And I wonder if anybody at this symposium or these group of scientists questioned him on this fucking double talk. The question of the likelihood of a serious accident is less easily disposed of. No shit, Sherlock. As I have said, even during the Manhattan Project, we realized that a nuclear ra reactor could undergo what is known as an excursion. That is, if too many control rods were removed, the reactor power could surge to dangerous levels. This, however, is not the main worry, for such excursions are inherently self-limiting, both in time and magnitude. 
Rather, the worry is that in a very high-powered reactor, immediately after the chain reaction has stopped, the fission products, at least momentarily, continue to generate 7% as much energy as is generated during fission operation. This afterheat decays at about 1% an hour. Thus, a 1 million kilowatt pressurized water reactor, which is producing, say, three times this amount of heat, will immediately after shutdown could continue to produce about 200,000 kilowatts of heat. This decays to 40 kilowatts in about an hour and to 15 kilowatts in 24 hours. Thus, a high-powered chain reactor must continue to be cooled for a considerable time after shutdown if fuel meltdowns are to be avoided. Well, we've already got no fuel meltdowns, motherfucker. I hope this guy's burning in hell. I honestly, I don't really believe in hell, but for people like him, I hope there is one. Here we go. I'm sorry, you guys. I can't help but cuss at these guys. They really piss me off. It was Edward Teller who, some 25 years ago, insisted with great prescience, I don't know this word, prescience, P-R-E-S-I-E-N-C, presence, it's not presence, prescience, that in these respects, nuclear reactors were potentially dangerous. And therefore, they should be subjected to the most searching kind of technical scrutiny before they were built. It was on this account that the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards was formed in 1953 with Roger McCullough as its first chair, and ACRS has ever since been immensely important in establishing norms for engineering practices that would forever prevent a loss of coolant or other accident. Well, this motherfucker failed, didn't he? For real. Like, really. The response of the engineer to the knowledge, the response of the engineer to the knowledge that an uncooled reactor was, dang was a dangerous thing went in two directions. First, and the most obvious, was to build a stout, airtight pressure containment bezel around every reactor. The second, perhaps less obvious, was to provide a high-powered was to provide high-powered reactors with what are called active engineered safety features. Various backup systems that would spring into action to make, that, make certain that in the event the main cooling system failed, there would be ample fire hoses available to prevent the reactor core from melting. Again, Major fucking fail times five in Fukushima, dumb fucks. Why bother with the backup cooling systems if the containment vessel in final analysis will catch whatever radioactive debris might be created if an, in an accident and thus prevent harm befalling the public? And indeed, this was the very attitude in the earliest days. The first containment vessel was a 225-foot diameter sphere with a sodium intermediate reactor in Schenectady. It was considered a last-ditch catch-all that, that in the event everything went wrong in the main system, the reactor would not create a public hazard. And look, he's got the word public as if he gives a fuck about the public underlined. Can you see that? Where is it? God, this guy makes me mad. See, just to stop, I can't, I can't see the words, but I hope I can see the underline. The public. Right there. Public hazard. Frick. Okay. Two considerations, however, led reactor designers to incorporate... <coughs> excuse me. Two considerations, however, led reactor designers to incorporate active engineered safety features. The lesser is that reactors are valuable devices 
and meltdowns, even contained ones, are messy. No shit. Thus, a gradu it gradually became apparent that such features as the emergency core cooling system were highly desirable, even if the reactor itself were surrounded by a containment shell capable of containing all accidents. The second consideration, however, is more fundamental and goes like this. As long as reactors were relatively small, we could prove by calculation that even if the coolant system and its backup failed, the molten fuel would not generate enough heat to melt itself through the containment. However, when reactors exceeded a certain size, then it was no longer to it was no longer possible to prove by calculation that an uncooled reactor fuel charge would not melt through its containment vessel. This hypothetical melt through is referred to as the China syndrome for obvious reasons. Obvious, right. Since we could not prove that a mountain fuel pool puddle wouldn't reach the basement of a reactor of a power reactor, we also couldn't prove whether it would continue to bore itself deeper into the ground. Wow. Whether or not the China syndrome is a real possibility is moot. The point is, however, that it is not possible to disprove its existence. Thus, for these very large reactors, it is no longer possible to claim that the containment shell, which for smaller con reactors could be relied upon to prevent radioactivity from reaching the public, was sufficient by itself. In consequence, the secondary backup cooling system, which originally were designed simply to prevent property loss and awkward cleanup, must now be viewed as the ultimate emergency protection against the China syndrome as an integral part of the reactor safety system. In saying this, I omit another deeply essential safety consideration and that is the extraordinary care that the nuclear engineer, designer, constructor, and operator take at every stage to ensure that the initiating malfunctions that could require emergency cooling will never occur. I'm going to stop there. Obviously, these arrogant motherfuckers were so arrogant, I think they actually believed the bullshit lies they were saying. So... Anyways, you guys, I'm going to end here. Uh, please continue to support the Post Ignorance Project. Listen to my radio show that will start on uh, August 3rd, hopefully, if everything goes right in this next week. It's going to be on ucy.tv. Uh, the name of the show is going to be The Age of Fission. And that will be on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Listen to the Post Ignorance Project on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Kevin Blanche has his own style, his own show, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, five days a week from 8 a.m. 9 a.m. UCY.TV has given the uh, really basically the anti-nuclear uh, format to this to their radio show. And I hope that uh, you will uh, join us. And you can call in on my show. I'm going to have call in so we can have some conversation about it. But it's really imperative that we make this a daily conversation with people. These kind of nuclear lies, this nuclear liar is considered a respected scientist in the nuclear industry. This is why we're completely fucked. And this is why we have to just keep pushing back not get caught up in petty things with each other or you know as far as I'm concerned all these the internet gossip with that guy I don't want to say his starts with a D uh, he's just a lunatic and I think we should just ignore him so this is why I've really never addressed it I think crazy people you just need to ignore and malicious people you need to ignore they're like batterers and I know he's giving Dana and Kevin a hard time and I think that's bullshit so anyways, you guys, uh, I will be back in a couple days. I've got homework. I've got work. I started summer school. I'm going to finish this article. probably take me a little while because I'm going to read two or three pages. But 
Ciao, you guys. Put your courage feet on, and uh, let's keep pushing the ball down the field. We're gonna, we're gonna win. We are gonna win because we have the right ideas. We have truth on our side, and they can lie about Fukushima, but Fukushima is not gonna lie about itself. And you know, it's time for us to help people find their courage to face these lies. Call these fucking rats out for the lies that they've been telling people, and even the scientists. So, talk to you later. Ciao.